Good morning, everyone. I know it's early for some, late for others with jet lag, but welcome to Asia Society's Arts and Museum Summit. I am Melissa Chu, Museum Director of Asia Society in New York City, and it's a pleasure to be here at our Hong Kong Center. Our aim with the proceedings today of the summit is to bring together some of the key thinkers about museums, mostly directors and curators, but also artists and scholars, to discuss museums of the 21st century. Indeed, what would the world be like without museums? We know so much more about life, ideas, and creativity because we have them. They didn't always exist, but one might locate the tendency to collect objects and order them through taxonomy as a tendency born from the Wunderkammer or Cabinet of Curiosities of Europe in the 16th century. These contained largely natural history objects such as fishbone skulls and other kinds of assortments, mostly from exotic or faraway places. We know, for example, that there were also collections being formed here in Asia much, much earlier. In fact, records indicate that the Chinese imperial collection was actually begun in the Song Dynasty from the 10th to the 13th century. So there is a tradition of connoisseurship and collecting here in the region if there is not in terms of public museums. The transition from these cabinets of curiosities to royal collections for public display in Europe that is making the transition from the private to the public was an important one. The idea of a public, an audience, or visitor is fundamental to the idea of a museum today. It's the idea of a direct encounter with art that defines the work that museums do. It was Lars Nitve who in last night's discussion said how important terminology is. He described this as the transformation from a visitor to a guest to a user much like a library where the user would come to the museum not once but often, in encountering the art like books to be read and enjoyed over and over. Although the transition of museums over the past three centuries for Europe and America appears seamless, as all stories told from hindsight, but we have seen great transformations of museums even since the 1980s. They have evolved greatly from research-driven, monolithic-type institutions to those enamored with the blockbuster exhibition, which taught museums greater engagement skills or how to connect to a public. What surprised me about yesterday's panel discussion was how much commonality there was around certain issues facing museums today. And if I were to identify those, I would say that firstly, uh, there was an idea of a foster, fostering a kind of global perspective or multiplicity of views. The second would be this idea of a transformation, whether it was a transformative experience possible through art. And finally, participation, whether interactive art, such as performance art, or participation through an online community that social media today especially allows. But what is the backdrop against which museums set their sights for change? I believe that the two, uh, two of the most substantial issues of our time in terms of scale of impact are urbanization and technology. Urbanization and migration are changing our societies. Demographic shifts are defining this change. For example, the latest US census reveals that approximately 49% of children under the, under the age of five in the US are racial and ethnic minorities, leading many to define a new kind of normal that is not white American for the near future. Here in Asia, there are different issues. For example, Japan's aging population, where 20% are over the age of 65 today. These demographic and to some extent localized differences, when seen in tandem with the global trend of urbanization, signal sizable changes for the environments that museums inhabit. 
Equally significant, I think, for Asia is that eight of the top 10 mega cities are here in this region. And it is museums in the city that is really a significant issue that we're going to tackle later on here at this summit. Where once there were many museum directors who would not allow television kiosks or video art in the galleries alongside static art objects for fear that they would detract from the experience of art, and where once museums would not allow photographs in their galleries at all for fear of copyright issues, and yet it seems today impossible to prevent people with smartphones from taking photographs and the idea that museums actually want visitors to share their experience through social media. Things are indeed changing. As from last, last night's conversation, there is a growing consensus about understanding our virtual visitors as well as our physically present visitors. And speaking of new technology, in the tech business, there is always a talk about disruption. Is there a factor that will so substantially threaten a museum's existence that we have not yet thought about or recognized the importance of its impact? It is our hope that by having the discussions today, some of those issues might come to light. It would be true to say that one of the real issues on our horizon that holds great potential is the development of new museums here in Asia. Wang Chunchen last night identified over 3,000 new museums in China. And there are many new developments across the region as well as here in Hong Kong. Just as MoMA was founded as a very different organization from the Musée Guimet in Paris, both in different centuries. Should the new crop of museums being built here in Asia replicate current models of museum practices? How will they be adapted for the circumstances here? It is no mistake that we've chosen here in Hong Kong to begin this conversation where we have a center and presence now for over 20 years, and of course now a beautiful building. This is the inaugural Arts and Museum Summit, which will be an annual event, an attempt to convene a conversation that has the potential to build a network across the region amongst museums. This summit is just one piece of a broader effort on the part of Asia Society to connect Asia to the world. Asia Society has over 50 years of experience in working with museums here in the region. We were one of the first museums to tour our Rockefeller collection to China, for example, in 1999, now 14 years ago, to the Shanghai Museum. We were also organizer of the very first loan exhibition from Vietnam to the United States. And in just over a year from now, the first ever loan exhibition from museum collections in Myanmar, Burma. It is through these discussions today, as well as others, that our bilateral conversation, such as our US-China Museum Leaders Forum that we launched last year, they all define our commitment to opening up possibilities for exchange between and amongst museums. Finally, I'd like to thank the supporters of this summit that include the Getty Foundation in particular as well as H2 Foundation for Arts and Education, Hallam Chow, the Fanjur Foundation for Arts and Education, and Mitch and Jolene Jolis. We appreciate their support. And now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Glenn D. Lowry, the director of the Museum of Modern Art. Glenn leads a staff of 760 people and directs an active program of exhibitions, acquisitions, and publications. The sixth director of the museum and a strong advocate of contemporary art, he has lectured and written extensively in support of contemporary art and artists and the role of museums in society, amongst many other topics. Lowry is a member of the, museum, the Mori Art Museum International Advisory Committee and the Istanbul Modern International Advisory Board. 
He's also a steering committee member for the Aga Khan Award for Architecture and a member of the American Philosophical Society and the National Academy of Arts and Letters. When we were thinking of who would be best to really launch our inaugural summit, we couldn't think of anyone better than Glenn. He's been a real leader in the field, not only an advocate for artists, but also museums, and um, really has uh, some great things to say about museum and art. We've been on many a panel together and enjoyed each other's company. So uh, after Glenn will speak, uh, we'll invite Alan Chong, who is the director of the Asian Civilizations Museum, to be a respondent for Glenn's talk. And then Hiroshi Sugimoto will speak. And then finally, we will open the floor to uh, questions from all of you. So please welcome Glenn D. Lowry. Thank you so much, Melissa, and I want to salute you and your remarkable staff on the great job you've already done. It's a pleasure to be here, especially to share a morning with Hiroshi Sugiboto, who's one of my uh, heroes and uh, a great friend and a terrific artist. Let me begin by uh, asking sort of the basic question that this summit seeks to address. What should museums of the 21st century look like? How should they display art and engage viewers? Is there a disruption to the current thinking that should be addressed? There's no doubt that the most museum growth in the next few decades will be in Asia. Just think of what is happening here in Hong Kong with M plus in the Central Police Station, or in Beijing with Namok, or in Seoul with the new Museum of Contemporary Art, and in Singapore with the new National Art Gallery, to name but a few places. And in, you can even include, uh, uh, let's see here, the National Art Gallery in uh, Singapore. What I want to try and do is raise a series of questions that we can use as a point of departure to talk about museums in the 21st century. These are not the only questions that one could ask. In fact, one could ask dozens more. But they seem to me to be questions that establish tensions. Uh, between different ways of thinking or perceiving the role of museums and the issues that drive them, some of which we've already touched on over the last uh, 24 hours, others of which I'm sure will become central to discussions uh, this afternoon. So to take tradition and disruption, one need only think of Ai Weiwei's great uh, photographic uh, image of the artist dropping uh, Ming vase to recognize that art is fundamentally disruptive. At its best, it takes tradition and shatters it, seeks to find new and different ways of connecting and communicating with people. And I, I love thinking about Ai Weiwei in this instance because for me, he's a metaphor of what all of our institutions are struggling with and have to figure out how to navigate. Now, places like the Museum of Modern Art came into existence because of places like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which at the turn of the 20th century thought that collecting contemporary art meant collecting Meissonnier. Yeah. But at the very moment that the Met was collecting Meissonnier, yeah, late 19th, very early 20th century artist, there were other artists that the Met thought weren't making art at all, like Cezanne. And the disruptive quality of Cezanne's art, which asked us to see the world differently, and to think about the act of art making differently gave rise to places like the Museum of Modern Art, who saw the possibility of a new audience for a new kind of art, and even envisioned a new kind of institution, one that was rooted on the street, that didn't separate itself from the community by stairs or a park, that recognized that it was integral to the vibrancy of the city. But all institutions, eventually become historic, even new disruptive ones like the Museum of Modern Art. So navigating and negotiating this notion of tradition and disruption becomes a central element that we in the 21st century need to think about. How are we going to sustain disruption, which is always inherent in the world around us, 
but often invisible to those of us who are running institutions. And how are we going to honor tradition, which is, after all, one of our responsibilities in the museum, to recognize the proliptic nature of the past in the present. Another question that we might want to think about, which we touched on yesterday, is the relationship of the spectator and the participant. Uh, Lars talked about a user as a kind of consequence of engagement with a museum, but I would argue that a user still has the wrong relationship with an institution because it doesn't imply ownership. And the difference between a spectator and a participant, I think, is the difference between looking at a work of art that was meant for you to think about at a distance and to be seen in a gallery not unlike this, that is laid out for you as a series of moments that are often almost passive in their relationship to you. You move through an ordered sequence developed by the institution in order for it to tell you a story that you need to know, as opposed to being a participant in the actual making of the art itself. And this is Roman Andak's Measuring Your Universe, which invites anyone who enters a gallery to have their height measured, their initials and date of uh, visit inscribed on the wall. And over time, everybody who walked in that gallery participated in the, in the creation of this art, which is constantly changing. The difference between the spectator and the participant is that the participant actually made the art. The artist was the catalyst, but each of us who had our height measured, who visited the gallery, is inscribed in the gallery. Our relationship with the institution has been fundamentally altered. We're no longer at a distance from the institution. We are the institution. And that transition from the idea of those who walk into the institution coming as spectators who have only a secondary relationship to what's going on, to participants who have an ownership relationship with the institution, I think is a central issue that every museum today has to navigate and decide where on that spectrum they want to come out. Now, there, these need not be absolute polarities. One can oscillate between being a spectator and a participant. An institution can alter its relationship to its public periodically. But there is a fundamental difference in how an institution conceives of itself if it thinks of its public as spectators or if it thinks of its public as participants. In the, and you know, it leads to work like Pipi Lodi Riss, Ever is All Over, uh, measure your body, it leads to Olafur Eliasson's extraordinary installation at the Tate, the recognition that as a participant, you're now engaged in a social experience. And that's the secondary dimension. A spectator is alone even if he or she is in a room with others. A participant is embarked on a social experience. And I think the fundamental shift that has occurred in at least museums of modern and contemporary art over the last decade is a recognition that almost no one goes to a museum alone. We always go with someone else, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, mother, a father, a sister, a brother, a friend. It doesn't matter. The moment you walk into that museum, although you're looking at art, what you're really doing is looking at art with someone else and recognizing the power inherent in the conversations that can be um, opened up by that experience is, I think, a critical driver as we go forward. Another issue that I think is essential to thinking about is freedom as opposed to constraints. How open can we be versus what must we do? Think about an artist like Yoko Ono, whose transgressive piece, voice piece for a soprano, invites visitors, participants, the public, to step up to a microphone and to shriek as loudly or as softly as they want. 
to fundamentally transgress the space of the institution, to do something that no museum would ever permit. In fact, it's, it's a piece that she did in the 60s that wasn't performed in a museum until much later because who would let somebody go into an institution and do this? If you just, and, and when we did it at the Museum of Modern Art, the people who were most disturbed by this were the curators on our staff who found it utterly unacceptable that noise from someone else could bleed into spaces that they had curated. But that freedom, that freedom to make the institution something else is utterly essential if we want to remain connected to artists. But working against that are some very basic realities that even the newest of museums has to ultimately face. We're physical spaces. We have responsibilities. We have people who work for us. We have buildings that need to ma maintain. We have collections that need to be stored. We have insurance that needs to be respected. That the infrastructure of museums works against their ability to be creative and free. And how do we negotiate and balance that? How do we recognize a responsibility to the works of art that we hold and trust for the public, to the public that actually uh, comes to our institutions? How do we respect that while at the same time encourage the kinds of transgressive acts that make things interesting? on-site and online. We talked about that uh, a bit yesterday. And I want to try and think about this from a slightly different perspective. There's no question that the experience of visiting an institution on-site, directly engaging with an artist or works of art, is what is at the heart of what we all believe uh, a museum experience should be. And at the same time, We've all learned that the capacity to extend our reach through online initiatives, whether they're social networks or websites, uh, is dramatic. Uh, and I think probably for most institutions, their online audiences will far outstrip their on-site audiences. But it seems to me that we have to be very smart about how we think about the relationship between online and off-site. Is the online experience a mirror of what happens on-site, or is it a separate location? Is it an opportunity to engage a completely new and different audience, or is it an opportunity to connect an existing audience with the institution 24-7? How we imagine the the virtual space of the digital world is an utterly essential way of understanding how we're going to use and interpret the physical space. And I think there's been in the 15 or so years that the online world has existed, a rapid evolution from seeing online opportunities as almost a, a way of promoting and advertising to seeing it as a way of disseminating information like images held in the museum, to seeing it as an opportunity to extend audiences. And now, I think, the next iteration is to see it collapse upon itself. So that while it is a separate and different place, it is absolutely twinned to the experience of being at the institution. And I think the ultimate goal is to create an environment in which those who come to museums or those who never visit museums but are interested in what they do, can share in the same conversation whenever and wherever they are. And that that conversation happens all the time. My last point that I want to make is the difference between analog and digital thinking. And here I don't want to think about digital as electronic. I want to think about it as a completely different mind frame from the analog. Most of our institutions are instruments of the Enlightenment, even if they were created in the 20th century, and they're inherently analog. They take as a point of departure a physical space in which we will navigate, an order which has been determined uh, by the professional staff that assumes an authority that allows one to talk to a public. Uh, and 
In that analog world, there are defined hierarchies, presumed responsibilities, and a very structured environment. And I want to borrow the words of Joy Ito, with whom I was lucky enough to be on a panel uh, several weeks ago in Tokyo, who sees the analog world uh, through a series of principles, sees the digital world through a series of principles that I think really bear thinking about how they relate to a museum. Talks about resilience instead of strength, which means you want to yield and allow failure in order to bounce back every time from your mistakes. Think about museums that could encourage failure, could admit failure, could see it as an integral part of their work, as opposed to ensuring that our public never knows we make mistakes. You need to pull instead of push, by which he means you pull the resources from the network as you need them, as opposed to centrally stocking them and controlling them. Think about a museum that is willing to give up its control. It's not going to be mine, believe me, but maybe it'll be Alan's. Um, but think about a museum that is willing to cede control, to recognize that you don't have to own everything you show, you don't have to control everything you do, and you could create an environment that invited experimentation. You want to take risk instead of focusing on safety. All of us as public institutions recognize a fundamental responsibility to our trustees, to our stakeholders, uh, to ensure the safety of our collections, the safety of our public. But the great leaps that are going to be made are going to be made by taking enormous intellectual and I think programmatic risks. And how do we encourage an institutional environment that is risk seeking as opposed to risk averse? You want to focus on the system, Ito says, instead of objects. All museums, by nature, are object-based. Although yesterday someone asked me a question, could we have a museum that didn't own objects? Well, she was actually talking about a system, a network that could exist, where works of art are collectively distributed among institutions. Probably impossible in my lifetime to see that happen. But imagine a museum that was a network and, or a system of relationships and objects rather than the owner of them. You want to have good compasses, not maps. In other words, you want to not know where you're going, but not feel lost. You want to have that ability to navigate rather than to follow a given route. You want to work on practice instead of theory, because sometimes you don't know why it works, but what is important is that it is working not that you have some theory around it. In other words, in order to take risks, you have to be practically oriented rather than always trying to have the answer framed out for you. You want to be disobedient rather than compliant. And here I love Ito's observation. You don't get a Nobel Prize for doing what you are told. <laughs> Too much of how we learn is about obedience. We should be celebrating disobedience, because at the end of the day, it's the crowd rather than experts that takes us to where we need to go. It's a focus on learning instead of education. And I think these issues are really at the heart of how we might imagine a digital institution. And this is just a, a sort of think chart that uh, I've been working on at the Museum of Modern Art with colleagues that endeavors to see a networked institution, and again, I don't mean networked in the purely electronic sense, in which the various aspects of our program, our activities, all feed into and are connected to each other in equal ways, and that we begin to imagine the institution in a very different way. Now, for existing institutions, the transition from analog to digital is going to be brutally difficult. But for new institutions, perhaps they can be created as digital institutions from the get-go. So let me try and wrap up with just a few thoughts as they relate at least to a place like the Museum of Modern Art. One, we want to build in our own disruption. We want to find partners, institutions, and artists who shake us up 
It's why we merged with MoMA PS1 in 2000. Not because they just had a great program, but because they knew, we knew they were going to make us crazy. Because they're an artist-centric institution that was always in a state of disruption, and we knew they could shake us up. Two, we want to take risks. We want to take the museum out of its wall. We want to do things we've never done before, like Doug Aiken's Sleepwalker Project that imagined the exterior of the museum as, as a public place that anyone could enjoy uh, a new work of art. We want to be a place where people participate, where that sense of social engagement is absolute, where the energy of the crowd feeds on itself and creates a dynamic environment. But we also want to be a place where a single individual can jump for joy and have a unique and private experience. And if we get it all right, we want to see the museum as an engine, a catalyst in the urban environment that feeds on the energy of the city and gives something back to the city in turn through its own energy. Thank you very much.